Okay. Here I am, live, at the Walter Bosley channel, where you don't get the same discussion three times a week on the same tired old topic. Um, you know, you won't hear the won't hear me go on and on about the same two points about ufology day after day, week after week. I try to give you a variety here at the Walter Bosley channel, and I think uh, many of the new subscribers, um, that's one thing they like that's brought them here. <coughs> so tonight I want to discuss um, actually one of my favorite research topics, and that is the City of Manuscript 512. Now, what is Manuscript 512? Well, in 1794, um, a patrol of what they called Banderistas, these were um, Portuguese explorers in the uh, 18th century, um, exploring the interior of Brazil, <laughs> specifically the Mato Grosso jungle. And um, they returned after, uh, the, I believe it's a decade of exploration at, at various points at which they got lost in the jungle, which that's easy to do there. Um they came back, and their commander um, filed an astonishing report. And this report is known as Manuscrito 512 or Manuscript 512. And I have a photo in here <coughs> of it. Oh, oh, there it is. Right there. Okay. And as you see, there's a piece missing from that page. Well, this document, written in Portuguese, remained um, in the archives in Rio de Janeiro and was not translated into English until uh, the mid-late 1860s. And specifically by Isabel Burton, the wife of Sir Richard Francis Burton. Now, as you know, in this book, The Lost Expedition of Sir Richard Francis Burton, I lay out my hypothesis based upon his past, his known explorations, his known research, based upon what is known about his lost expedition, uh, that the four and a half, five months or so that we know nothing in any of the documented record that's been made public anyway, that we know nothing of where he was exactly while in South America during these lost months. So... That fascinated me. That resulted in this book, which is actually Secret Missions 2, the second book in the Secret Missions series. And I argue that uh, Burton very specifically went in search of and very possibly found the city of Manuscript 512. We're told that his wife was the first English translator of this manuscript. And this was done in, I think, the last two weeks before he departed for South America to take a diplomatic post, followed by his wife soon after. And after three years of serving that diplomatic post, Burton sends his wife home to, to pack and be ready for the next assignment in Damascus, or somewhere in the Middle East. They not, they're not sure that it's Damascus at the time. And then he goes off and disappears after leaving um, uh, Buenos Aires. And very little 
Very little is known of the months that followed. <clears throat> and even what we know from him was just some anecdotal tale told at a party. Now, why does this matter? Why is this interesting? Because Sir Richard Francis Burton was a man who wrote profusely about every little thing he did. I'm, I'm not kidding you about the profusely. In 1860, Burton went on a trip across the U.S., the U.S. of the time. And he spent about three weeks or so in Salt Lake City, hanging out with Brigham Young and the like. And he wrote an entire book about those three and a half weeks. And I got to tell you, that is singularly the most boring book Rich, Richard Francis Burton ever wrote. And I read every damn word of it. So he writes a book about that, but not a word about missing months down in South America, in the South American wilderness. I mean, with all the rich stories we have now about ancient tunnels and lost cities and what have you, and all these ruins, that amaze us even to this day, including Puma Punku. Um, Burton finds nothing to write about during those four and a half months. As you know, this book here that I wrote is my bullshit flag on that. Um, I think Burton indeed wrote a very detailed, extensive report, likely book length, and that that report remains classified yes, even in 2023, remains classified um, almost 200 years after it was written and submitted. I think it was submitted to um, British intelligence, primarily. Uh, the Royal Geographic Society probably got their look at it. Um, but I also suspect Burton was working for another organization outside of British intelligence and the Royal Geographic Society. And I go into that in this book. Um, in my mind, he likely worked as much on the translation of Manuscript 512 as did Isabel. They were a great partnership. They had an amazing marriage. And she absolutely would have gone along with taking public credit for the translation. You have to understand, Isabel at that time was just learning Portuguese. Okay? So, you have a document like Manuscript 512, okay, telling about this mysterious city, which I'll be getting into the details of um, here momentarily. Um, and you have Burton for three years going all over the Mato Grosso jungle, all over Brazil. Um, he ends up writing a two-volume work titled Explorations in the Central Highlands of Brazil, in which he goes and does his diplomatic and historical interest visits to all the territory surrounding where this city of Manuscript 512 was claimed to have been found. But he says not a single word in either volume about lost cities or manuscript 512. But here's what's interesting. In the index of this work, Exploration in the Central Highlands of Brazil, he includes the uh, image of that I showed you. Let me find it again here. Uh, what did I do with it? This image here. He includes a copy of this image here of the manuscript in Portuguese and his wife's translation. There's not a word about this manuscript in his book, and yet in the index he includes that. So what does that tell you? It should tell any Burton scholar who's not in denial, who doesn't suck up to, you know, mainstream academia. It should tell any Burton scholar that that is exactly what he was looking for were clues to this lost city laid out, detailed in the manuscript. Clearly, that's what Burton was looking for. 
And I argue that that's what occupied his time during the missing months of his life. The only months on which he was on expedition, which he, we have found or seen, read not a single word about. Makes no sense. And then when he emerges later in Lima, Peru, he's worse for the wear. He's haggard. He's ragged. He's been somewhere and likely seen something astonishing. So again, what is this city of Manuscript 512? Well, apparently, it had legendary status among the people aware of the document and with Burton. And um, interestingly enough, the um, Portuguese poet uh, Camões, and I always I'm I apologize if I mispronounce that name. <clears throat> As I go into in the book, uh, Los or Os Luciados, okay, which is the the historical national epic of Portugal, um, written by Camões. And I might add that I have um, uh, an edition of Os Luciados, I think translated by Burton, if I'm not mistaken, on my um, to-read pile that I'm in the middle of taking a look at. In that epic, again, which I analyze in here, um, in that epic, we have a, a, an episode, series of episodes, what have you, a part in which Vasco da Gama, the Portuguese explorer, actually does come to South America. And he is shown this site of an ancient forgotten city. He's also shown the, the workings of, the, it, it's hard to describe, it's like the workings of the planet in space, uh, very similar to um, what is described in the Book of Enoch when the watchers show Enoch the workings of the sphere, right? You know, some people say the music of the spheres is connected to all this, but how the, 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 the machinery of the planets and such, it's very similar to that. But it has Vasco da Gama, who historically, we're told, never made landfall in South America. We're told that he only came within 600 miles of the shores of Brazil. I argue that that's close enough that um, there's another secret missions book. Uh, I think da Gama did come to Brazil. I think he uh, reported it to very few people. And I think that's how Pedro Cabral knew um, specifics about getting to Brazil, where to land, and such like that, because he, you know, was a student of Vasco da Gama. But history tells us da Gama did not land Brazil. I, I, I don't know. I think Camões seemed to um, know something about that, um, and that's why he wrote that episode in Os Luciados. But what's interesting is, um, in Os Luciados. The epic, let me get my reading glasses here, um, we have a description of the city. Let me, um, I think I've got it marked already. Yikes, folks, I apologize for this. I thought I had the marker on the part where Okay, here we go. <clears throat> now, we have Os Luciatus is the second connection of manuscript 512 to Burton. It's resonant similarity to the aforementioned work of the poet adventure at Um It's pretty straightforward. Let us return to the segment of Camões Os Luciados, and I'm quoting from Os Luciados. 
O loved of heaven, what never men before, what wandering science never might explore, by heaven's high will, with mortal eyes to see, great nature's face unveiled is given to thee. Thou and thy warriors follow where I lead. Firm be your steps, for arduous to the tread, through matted breaks of thorn and briar bestrewed, with splintered flint, winds, or sorry, winds the steep slippery road. She spake, and smiling caught the hero's hand. This is the guide. And on the mountain's summit soon they stand, a beauteous lawn with pearl enameled over. Now, the phrases which I have highlighted are, in my analysis, resonant with elements of the account in Manuscript 512. Specifically, the phrases, arduous to the tread and matted breaks of thorn and briar, could refer to the difficulty of traversing the unexplored terrain as experienced by the party in the manuscript 512. Okay? But it is with the words bestrewed with splintered flint that we find what may be a direct reference in the description of the path of the manuscript party's ascent, which consisted of loose stones piled up whence we thought it had once been a paved road broken up by the injuries of time. Now, that last part was a quote directly from Manuscript 512, okay? So again, <clears throat> in Os Luciados, the way is bestrewed with splintered flint. In Manuscript 512, Okay, the party's ascent was on a path which consisted, quoting from manuscript 512, of loose stones piled up once we thought it had once been a paved road broken up by the injuries of time. Well, splintered flint, okay, matches that description. So here we have in Camuins Os Luciados um, a direct reference to a phrase in manuscript 512. Could Camoans have been aware of what was in Manuscript 512? Next, in Camoans' phrase, and on the mountain's summit, soon they stand, might refer to where the leader of the Manuscript 512 party says, we halted at the top of the mountain, which commanded an extensive view. Okay, that sounds like both are describing the top or summit of a mountain, correct? Then there is Camoans, this is from Os Luciados, um, Cam Camoan's phase, phrase, a beauteous lawn, beauteous lawn with pearl enameled over. Now, this intriguingly brings to mind the manuscript author's description of the view of the crystalline mountain when it appeared to us like snow struck by the solar rays. Okay? <clears throat> now, let's... Um, Let's go back to Os Luciados. Mm -hmm. Where is it? I'll be darn. Oh, index. Okay. Let me, let me do a little cheating here. And, well, I'll be darned. Where is... Folks, I'm sorry. I seem to have misplaced my phone, which has uh, the handy internet on it. What do you mean it's lost your phone? Yeah. Oh, I'll look right here. Can you pull up the internet for me, and then I'll do a search. Sorry about that. Because I'm looking up a very important point to make about, thank you, about the similarities between Camoans, um, Os Luciados, and Manuscript 512. Here's the thing. Os Luciados is a Portuguese epic poem written by Luz Vaz de Cam Camões and first published in 1572. So if anything, it could be argued that the commander of the Banderistas who claimed to have found this city in 1794 in Brazil was actually 
using Os Luciados as his source. Now, some would argue, why would he do that? If it was entirely made up of whole cloth, inspired by Os, by Os Luciados, which predates Manuscript 512 by 200 years, then was he expressing some code for riches and wealth, mineral resources, in other words, because Burton um, wrote a lot about the mining industry that was around this area of um, the Mato Grosso, where <coughs> this uh, lost city of Manuscript 512 is supposedly located. Now, what's interesting is also that Joseph Smith, um, the inventor of Mormonism, um, as many know, claimed to have learned about a lost civilization down in Latin America, which uh, he called one particular region, he called Zarahemla. That's also the name of a particular city that he claimed was down there. And the description in the Book of Mormon of this Zarahemla is also suspiciously similar to what's in Manuscript 512. The problem with the Joseph Smith reference that's very similar, almost identical to Manuscript 512, is that the Book of Mormon, of course, um, uh, was written... Uh, years before Manuscript 512 was translated to English, which is very interesting. It implies that perhaps Joseph Smith or his source could translate Portuguese. The problem with that is that this manuscript lay in the archives in Rio de Janeiro, um, essentially unknown, certainly unknown to a guy who was, you know, uh, establishing a cult and then a religion and such in the uh, Western United States at the time. Unless um, Joseph Smith had uh, incredible diplomatic ties to Brazil at that time, um, which I'm not aware of, you know, how do you explain this? Does it mean that... Um, he got his hands on an English translation of Os Luciatus. One could argue that, indeed. Now, there are parts that um, were not exactly in Os Luciados that turned up in Joseph Smith's version of what went on down there in South America. I have discussed this in another video um, in the uh, catalog there. If you go through videos and lives and look for Manuscript 512, you, you will find where I read the comparison and um, how nearly identical um, the descriptions of what happened are from Manuscript 512. But I'll go through it again a little bit. Um, <clears throat> here we go. Yikes. Okay. The Lost Mormon Cities, a third connection between Richard Burton and Manuscript 512 is to be found in his exposure to Mormon scriptures. Remember that trip he took to Salt Lake in 1860. Now, this is before, you know, just a few years before going down to South America to really um, explore and take a look and be a diplomat, we are told, around the same area that the Mormons believe this lost civilization, Zarahemla, is located. Uh, 
let's look at the Book of Mormon. And it came to pass in the 30 and 4th year in the first month, on the fourth day of the month, there arose a great storm, such an one, such as one as never had been known in all the land. And there was also a great and terrible tempest, and there was terrible thunder in his in so much that it did shake the whole earth as if it was about to divide asunder. There, there can be nothing more clunky than reading scriptural English in diction. Jesus. <clears throat> no pun intended. And there were exceedingly sharp lightnings. That's highlighted there. Exceedingly sharp lightnings, such as never had been known in all the land, and the city of Zarahemla did take fire. And the city of Moroni did sink into the depths of the sea, and the inhabitants thereof were drowned. And the earth was carried up upon the city of Moronia, that in the place were Moronia, however, tomato, tomato, that in the place of the city there became a great mountain, and there was a great and terrible destruction in the land southward, again emphasized. But behold, there was a more great and terrible destruction in the land northward, and on and so forth. And the highways were broken up, and the level roads were spoiled, and many smooth places became rough. Now remember what I said earlier about what was written about the splintered flint and the, the rough, loose stone road. Now, that's from Manuscript 512. That's also from Os Luciatus, right? And here it is in the Book of Mormon. And many great and notable cities were sunk, and many were burned, and many were shaken, till buildings thereof had fallen to the earth. And the inhabitants thereof were slain, and the places were left desolate. And there were some cities which remained, but the damage thereof was exceedingly great, and there were many in them who were slain. And there were some who were carried away in the whirlwind, and whither they went no man knoweth. Now that's going to be really important when I get into my major point tonight. This is Book of Mormon. And there were some who were carried away in the whirlwind, and whither they went no man knoweth. That's very interesting. Um, and behold, the rocks were rent in twain. They were broken up upon the face of the whole earth, inasmuch, insomuch that they were found in broken fragments and in seams and in cracks upon all the face of the land. Now that all is from 3 Nephi 8, 5 to 18, the Book of Mormon. Okay? Now, here's what's from Manuscript 512. The... Um, in the Book of Mormon, the phrase is exceedingly sharp lightnings. In Manuscript 512, remember, written almost a hundred years before the Book of Mormon, it's written, uh, in each corner of the said square was a needle in imitation of that used by the Romans, but some had suffered ill usage and were broken as if struck by thunderbolts. So the Book of Mormon, you have exceedingly sharp lightnings that had hit structures. And in the Manuscript 512, written a hundred years before and not translated into English until after the Book of Mormon was written, you have the phrase as if struck by thunderbolts. Okay. Now, another one. The Book of Mormon says, quoting, the city of Zarahemla did take fire. In Manuscript 512, the phrase the, is the fronts of carved stone were already blackened. <clears throat> stone gets blackened through fire. Okay. So there you have a similarity right there. Now, again, back to the Book of Mormon, you have a great and terrible destruction in the land southward. Okay. Manuscript 512 is, of course, a report on a semi-destroyed uh, lost city in South America, which is southward of where Smith would have been writing his thing. Uh, Book of Mormon says, highways were broken up and the level roads were spoiled and many smooth places became rough. In Manuscript 512, it says, we began the ascent, which consisted of loose stones piled up, whence we thought it had once been a paved road broken up by the injuries of time. Again, Book of Mormon, highways were broken up and the level roads were spoiled and many smooth places became rough. Manuscript 512, a hundred years older than the Book of Mormon, says, um, whence we thought it, uh, uh, we began the ascent, which consisted of loose stones piled up, whence we thought it had once been a paved road broken up by the injuries of time. You, you see the similarities there. Again, Book of Mormon. Inhabitants thereof were slain, and the places were left desolate. Manuscript 512 says, um, this, this is where the, uh, the manuscript is torn. So you get the phrase, um, 
of corpses, which is part of the unhappy, too much damage, and forsaken perhaps on account of some earthquake. So, um, you know, there you have desolation and, and destruction. Uh, <clears throat> you get the idea. Uh, Joseph Smith allegedly discovered the golden plates from which we are told the Book of Mormon events were transcribed in September 1823. Okay. Manuscript 512 lay in the Brazilian archives for 86 years before being discovered in 1839 by Manuel Lagos. The English translation did not happen until 1865. So, Manuscript 512 laying virtually unknown in the archives of uh, Brazil in Rio de Janeiro um, until what is it? 16 years after Smith writes the Book of Mormon. Okay. So Smith could not have had access to manuscript 512, but how did he get such um, close details? Where did he learn about the city of manuscript 512? You know, we have to ask, um, but there's no way he could have plagiarized its contents. Okay. <clears throat> um, Lagos being familiar with the Book of Mormon, not likely, and he he did not forge manuscript five one two. Okay, uh, five one two was written in seventeen fifty three, decades prior to Smith's birth. Monjo Daro had been abandoned around 1,900 BC and wasn't rediscovered until 1922. And the bodies of Pompeii were not discovered until 1863. So neither of these could have directly inspired either the manuscripts Portuguese explorers or Joseph Smith to fabricate tales of corpses being found among the ruins. Um, <coughs> now, there is a scholar whose name I still haven't been able to identify. He goes by Practical Eschatology online. And he suggests that the mysterious uh, letters and characters found engraved on walls and in architecture reported by the Banderista commander in Manuscript 512 may have been in the same language or dialect as the plates that Joseph Smith claims to have found in New York. Now, here is where um, my new suggestion comes in this evening. And that is, I am beginning to suspect that the answer to the mystery city excuse me, of Manuscript 512 may be found in what we call Vedic history. This city, these cities that um, Joseph Smith talks about, and essentially I think took um, to create his Book of Mormon, to create his spin that um, many people identify them as the Toltecs, that uh, th th these lost tribes um, of Israel, so to speak, uh, came over here and established the civilization. I, I don't think I I'm, I'm doubting that. Um, I think that the city and manuscript five, one, two is much better explained from the Vedic perspective. Now <laughs> you've heard me talk about the calm empire. The calm empire was that maritime based uh, expansive empire that stretched from India all the way to the Pacific Islands and, and likely reached the shores of North and South America. And the Kham Empire, which looked them up, C-H-A-M, this isn't something out of my imagination. This is something that is a legitimate scholarly thing. Uh, David Childress, by the way, has written an excellent book overview on the Kham Empire. So, um, despite what some of you might think of him. Um, it really is one of his best books, one of his best research books. But the Kham Empire 
uh, was made up of um, uh, cultures uh, from India, uh, the region of Egypt and North Africa, and all through Southeast Asia, okay, and um, the Pacific Islands. It was a massive empire. You you could argue that whatever this Lemuria uh, actually was, the Kham Empire might explain it or was, you know, part of it, for example. Um, now, I have offered the Kham Empire as the source of the mysterious um, uh, underground uh, necropolis outpost, what have you, uh, reported in the Grand Canyon in 1908. Okay, in the Arizona Gazette. Uh, look that up, you'll find it out there. And the description which the author of the article uh, gives to this necropolis, this ancient site found in um, the Grand Canyon, it's described almost in... Um, Egyptian terms. Well, think about it. In 1908, something like the Kham Empire, certainly with the influence of Egypt, but also India, um, and uh, uh, then Siam, now Thailand, and so forth, certainly might have, um, for lack of knowledge of the Kham Empire, certainly could have looked somewhat Egyptian. Now, if you recall, if you read that article, the description is that not exactly Egyptian is, you know, what was found and reported. Now, of course, um, this would be immediately suppressed after being reported because it does not fit the standard academic narrative that at the time the Smithsonian Institution and American Academia were really pushing hard and continue to do so. But the Kham Empire would really go a long way to explain that story of the uh, lost necropolis city of the dead, if you will, reported as being found in the Grand Canyon in 1908. Now, I thought about this, and when I looked at the history from the Vedic research perspective, and uh, having the benefit of some recently acquired um, Vedic historical literary sources, courtesy of our good friend Nick here, um, sent me some invaluable research materials on um, history from the, from the Vedic perspective, I was able to dig into this and follow up on the suspicion, and I was not disappointed uh, at all. Um, that's why I wanted to talk about this with you tonight. Let me share with you, <clears throat> from the Vedic perspective, now look, you don't have to agree with this. You can, you know, you can very uh, calmly and, and comfortably just embrace your your Western civilization point of view and stick with that. You don't need to consider anything outside of the West if, if that makes you feel more comfortable. Okay. However, the the um, the mind seeking, seeking truth and answers um, is a little more open to what may be the intellectually uncomfortable. So, you know, you might find this interesting, but those of you who are sold on Western civilization and the Western perspective being the end-all be-all of knowledge, well, you know, I understand if this doesn't interest you. Don't you love it when I'm a smart ass? Okay, so <clears throat> I'm referring to, and again, thank you, Nick N. You know who you are, our friend Nick who sent me the amazing model kit stuff. Thank you for this book. Um, this is a two-volume set, folks. The World Vedic Heritage, A History of Histories by P.N. Oak. Again, Nick, thank you. This is just invaluable reference material here. And uh, again, this is just a reference source. <clears throat> Vedic Past of America is one of the chapters. Um 
let me get to some of the major points that I highlighted. He points out certain words as having a Sanskrit origin. Here, here's what's now again. I haven't followed through on researching the research yet. I just highlighted some points that are interesting to consider, and I want to say that I have um, read this same idea. Um, there's a writer out there named Gene Matlock. He's the author of a short book titled "The Last Book on Atlantis You'll Ever Need to Read," something like that, and he points out some of these very same points um, about the ancient East Indian um, uh, etymology in some of our words here. Okay, The term Canada, according to this source, derives from an ancient Vedic nuclear scientist, ancient Vedic nuclear scientist, he says, known as Kanad, K-A-N-A-A-D. Okay, I got to follow up on that, but that's that's really interesting. Aztec, according to Oak, is the term Aztic, A-S-T-I-K, i.e. the theist alias believers in divinity. Okay. <clears throat> Uruguay, which is a country in South America, according to Oak, is from uh, Uragava, meaning the god Vishnu. Interesting. Guatemala. Another name of a country is uh, also a Sanskrit term uh, pronounced Guatemala, meaning the abode of the sage Gautam. <clears throat> Arhuntana in Sanskrit signifies silver or anything silvery. Arhuntana. Consequently, the fact that Argentina is well known for its silver mines as an indication of the Sanskrit origin of its name. Um, I believe also the Latin root, right, Argent for silver, but did that come from Arhuntana, the Sanskrit? This author, Oak, would say that it did. Um, he claims that the Ia, or Ia, Ending of country names such as Colombia, Bolivia, Patagonia, which is a region like Russia and Siberia, is distinctly Sanskrit. Okay, that's that's interesting. Venezuela, according to Oak, is Vana Ujwal, the glorious forest. That's interesting. He he goes on with uh, Mexico is the Sanskrit term Mosaka, M O X A C A connoting a place of salvation abounding in temples, seminaries, monasteries, sarais, and Vedic hermitage schools during pre-Christian times. Um, he shows what looks like Hanuman, the monkey god, in uh, an ancient Mexican figure, <coughs> which is interesting. The idol of a monkey deity was discovered while digging at a Mexico City subway station. Okay. He is said to be the wind god Echtil of the Aztec people, whose breath started the movement of the Aztec sun. Now get this. Aztec being, according to Oak, the Sanskrit term Aztec, implying a devout, God-fearing, God-honoring, and God-worshipping people, okay, religious people, in Vedic lore. Now remember, the, the let's go back. That idol of a monkey deity was discovered while digging at a Mexico City subway station. Okay, this was reported in 1990. Uh, the monkey idol deity in Mexico is said to be the wind god Echtil of the Aztec people whose breath started the movement of the Aztec sun. In Vedic lore, Hanuman, the monkey god, is said to be the son of the wind who tried to fly to the sun at a young age. Okay? So you got the sun, you got the wind, you got a monkey figure. Come on, people. There's something interesting going on there by way of some type of cultural connection. Now, according to Oak, after the devastation of the great Mahabharat, Mahabharat War, circa 5,561 BC, when world communications broke down, the American continents remained isolated for several centuries. The Mahabharat War. And then it ended up 
isolating the American continents. Oak asks the question, who discovered America? He claims India continued to be in constant touch with the Americas during the millenniums of a world Vedic empire. Could the Kham empire have been part of what he calls, or could it explain what he calls the Vedic empire, particularly after this war? But that implies, you know, before the war. Mexican tradition says that their ancestors came from a beautiful far-off land. Okay, a far-off land. <clears throat> According to Oak, Professor Rama Mina, curator of the Mexican National Museum, records in his book, Mexican Archaeology, about the Mexicans, quoting, the human types, human types, the people are like those of India. Okay. Dr. Magana Pion and Professor Humberlo Cornyn members of the Geographical Society of Mexico, have concluded that as far as Nahuatl, Zapoteca, and Maya languages are of Hindu-European origin. This is on page five of their book, Hindu America. Nahuatl, Zapoteca, and the Maya languages are originated in, according to these authors, Hindu. Isn't that interesting? Furthermore, Oak writes, the Tezuco mentioned in Mexican tradition is the term Texaca of the Indian Puranas. Texaca was a king of the Naga tribe of the netherworld. <clears throat> Professor Magana Pion concludes that the Mexican civilization is at least 10,000 years old. This is, this is interesting. Um, it is interesting to read these points because of the perspective, the perspective being different from what we're used to. It forces you to consider these possibilities. And when you consider the Vedic possibility, things that were remaining questions and unanswered beforehand begin to make more sense. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> now, the this book is just fantastic. Again, Nick, thank you for this resource. Um, <clears throat> you know, I could go on and on uh, uh, quoting from this and referring to it, but think about... <laughs> the description I read from manuscript 512 about the destruction that was visited upon the city, right? And the lightnings and the earthquakes and, 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 and the whirlwind. Remember that I said that would be important? The whirlwind that reportedly took up certain survivors of the cataclysm? Well, when you consider the war, the Mahabharat war, which referencing the Mahabharata, the, uh, the, the, the Ramayana, okay. The, the war that the Rama empire got into with another civilization, some argue Atlantis, um, could the destruction on this city have been part of that cosmic warfare or, you know, that Maha Mahabharata war talked about in the uh, Vedic scriptures, <coughs> It certainly, certainly fits when they talk about, you know, the lightning bolt weapons from the sky, very specifically in manuscript 512, um, the destruction and lightning bolts and, and, and uh, the cataclysmic energies and the fire, rain of fire coming down. Certainly, this best matches what we're told um, uh, from the Vedic perspective, okay, about this, this ancient war, which, by the way, some argue included, you know, some type of nuclear weaponry or missiles and such. From my perspective, in my opinion, um, the Vedic war perspective explains the destruction wrought upon the city of manuscript 512 
far better than the Book of Mormon, you know, some anger of God thing going on. Okay. Um, you know, this, this wrath of whatever, um, it, um, it, 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 it makes sense when you look at the, uh, the, the linguistic resonances like Oak pointed out in, uh, this particular volume of world Vedic heritage. Um, it makes a logical sense that the Western sources don't. Now, let's go back to Os Luciatus and Camlins. I'm about ready to do my deeper dive into Os Luciatus, having received the Burton translation of Camlins. And I will be doing that dive into um, what inspired Camlins. And I'll tell you, um, Camlins spent some time in India. Okay. Da Gama was known for exploring India. We have the East Indian Vedic connection to Os Luciados right there. And so I have a feeling that what we're going to learn about Camo and Zos Luciados is that um, he too learned the Vedic historic perspective and he learned something um, about this lost civilization in South America. <laughs> I came to the conclusion after doing this book, the research for this book, that I, I, I still reach and agree with now after, um, especially after looking at the Vedic perspective. And that is that, um, I do not think that the Banderista commander was making this up simply based on Os Luciados, even though it is possible, I will admit it is entirely possible that the Banderista commander was indeed, um, making something up in his report inspired by Camoan's epic. However, uh, we have to consider that perhaps this Banderista commander, based upon Os Luciados, went searching for this lost city. And based upon the description in Os Luciados, he found the lost city. Exactly as Camoan's described it. Um, that has to be considered and, and that's the thread I'm pulling. That's, that's what I'm pursuing. Um, uh, I think Burton, Burton was pulling the same thread. I think Burton understood and knew this because golly, where was the first place Sir Richard Francis Burton spent a lot of time as a young officer in the East India company? Oh, India the East India Company, right? And as you know, I go into the, the private personal explorations that Burton did in India, okay, conducted in India. So here we have a very deep, intimate knowledge of India, of the Vedic histories in the man who's... Um, wife is credited with doing the first translation on manuscript 512. The man who disappeared for four and a half to five months, okay, in the South American wilderness, we still to this day, okay, do not know what he saw there and where exactly he was, which is completely uncharacteristic of Sir Richard Francis Burton. He's got a connection <coughs> to India. Camlin's had a connection to India. Vasco da Gama, who's featured in Os Luciados, a known connection to India. There's linguistic connections to Latin America and, you know, India. Um, it's getting harder and harder to deny that there is some um, Vedic historical connection to 
the city of manuscript 512 and in general to the americas okay it's getting harder and harder to um just deny that out of hand when you consider all this okay it begins to it piles up and it adds up and it makes sense so i will continue pulling these threads now uh, as you recall in the middle of all this is our good friend Jan Potoshki, right? Because in his uh, manuscript found in Saragossa, he borrows from Os Luciados as well. Um, so this is all in the mix, all of it. And it, it, it's fascinating to me. Um, and I've just begun my deep dive on the Vedic historical perspective from um, from the very perspective of Vedic historians themselves, okay? Not just, um, you know, popular American books in, in um, popular archaeology and, you know, lost cities, ancient mysteries kind of thing, um, filtered through Western, you know, or uh, American popular authors on this stuff. No, we're talking um, scholars who really compile. This is... Uh, this set that uh, just this one source, this one source that Nick uh, provided me with um, between the two volumes. Let me see. <laughs> Is 1400 pages. Okay. So this is going to be quite the resource. And I'm going to check, do double checks against the the things in here. Okay. As I go further, but, um, I just really wanted to introduce that, um, I'm becoming more confident that there is some type of Vedic historical angle on the mystery of manuscript 512. Um, the, the, the city of manuscript 512 has fascinated me for a few years now, as you know. Um, and, um, uh, I haven't, uh, I haven't exhausted that fascination yet, and I haven't exhausted my research yet in it. So this is the direction I'll be going forward with this for a while until I'm convinced uh, otherwise, okay, that, you know, until I'm convinced there's nothing to it. So uh, already I've been on here an hour, and um, <laughs> I, I thank you for being patient with my dry throat. Thank God for the cough button. And um, uh, again, I appreciate your patience with that. What I want to do now is go to the live chat and take your questions. Um, oh, Nick is here again. Thank you, Nick. I'm telling you, I am loving these resources. And and this, this two-volume set is not the only source that Nick sent. And these are books from India by the way. So thank you, Nick. These are just going to be just, if you're into this stuff, it's fun. Okay. As dry as it might seem to a lot of people, it's all sorts of fun to me. So remember folks, all capitals, if you want me to acknowledge or see your comment, I want to thank everybody who's here. We got Mod Wiz, Johnny Side, Nick, and Philip Blair. We have... Uh, Dead Man Walking, we have Trotter, 7-Eleven, we have Action Faction, we have Michael Wentz, Gigi Abby Lynn, how are you Gigi Abby Lynn, and um, we have Easy Gamer, Easy Gamer 89, Tim Houston, okay, Juju Judio's here, I haven't seen you in a while. Rusty, Rusty Carpenter. Okay, I'm going to go down here so we can get started on the questions. And there's D. Dorothy Papineau. How are you? So remember, folks, if you got any questions or comments, all capitals, please, so that I can um, see it more clearly and know that you are indeed addressing me. Um, I want you to know, folks, that uh, really soon... Malia and I are going to be going on um, 
a research trip to South America to follow up on this very topic. I'm excited about this, okay? And I don't want to spill too many beans, but you might be able to join us. So more on that in the future. C.A. Bever Forden uh, says the Redheads New Zealand ancient history documentary, their history and DNA links them to Persia, India, and South America. Let's put that up there. Indeed, indeed, C.A. Bever Forden. That's, I'm telling you, the more you look at this stuff, the more connections there are. And you know what? It's really too bad that the Western civilization snobs just deny it wholesale, you know, just because, well, we're talking, you know, just like in Western civilization and in the, in the Yahwistic religions, we have the jealous God. Well, you know, all their, all his followers are, you know, it, it's jealousy and fear that someone might, my God, know more than they do. I'm glad you're alive, Gigi. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the more you look at this, Vedic historical perspective, the more sense that it, it really makes. Uh, Philip Blair asks, why might Richard Burton's mission still be classified? Who is the enemy that they're worried about should those files be de declassified? That's a very good question. I could be wrong. Maybe they're not classified because maybe, maybe he did not report to British intelligence. Maybe he did not report to the Royal Geographic Society. Maybe he only reported to a private party, which for their reasons is keeping it secret. Now, think of the breakaway type topics connected with South America. Think of the legend of Marconi disappearing to South America in his city. Think of all these things. Um, you know, here, here's what we do know. In his diary, Colonel Fawcett directly refers to the English translation by Isabel Burton, because that's who it was credited to, the English translation of Manuscript 512 as what inspired him to go look for his lost city of Z, which, by the way, I think is a direct reference to um, Joseph Smith's Mormon Zarahemla, obviously. But Fawcett was inspired by and went on his search for Z, okay, which ended up, you know, being the cause of his disappearance after reading the English translation of Manuscript 512, and the researcher at Practical Eschatology is the one who found um, this diary entry from Fawcett. So here's the thing. We know that Fawcett read Manuscript 512. Well, being a British intelligence officer, what other access did he have, or what access did he have to other documents, perhaps the report on uh, the, the, the missing months that Burton might have uh, posted somewhere. Okay. Somebody Burton wrote it down somewhere and somebody has it and Fawcett read it. And we know what happened to Colonel Fawcett. Mod Wiz says India is a cradle of civilization. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hey, river dogma pit bulls here. <clears throat> ML asks, do I follow Robert Sepper's work? I am familiar with Robert Sepper's work. Yes, indeed. Uh, Modwiz adds, Western snobbery about India is jealousy of an older civilization. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely it is. Whenever you encounter the snobbery, it, it is jealousy. It, it, it certainly is jealousy. Now, remember, remember, Mr. Oak, P.N. Oak, um, might not have, you know, his conclusions might not be exactly accurate, okay? What I'm saying is, I think it's very smart to consider the, the Vedic perspective on this, okay? It, it's time. It's time that we stop with the 
the ignorant snobbery. Hey, Todd Woods here. Hello, Todd Wood. Uh, Gigi Abby Lynn asks, we know what happened to him. Who are you referring to, Gigi? Fawcett? All we know is that he disappeared in South America in the Matagrosso looking for his beloved lost city of Z. But we do know that he learned about all that and was inspired to go in pursuit of what he would call Z because of Manuscript 512, that English translation credited to Isabel Burton. I think Isabel um, was involved with the translation of that. I think that's part of what uh, Burton, uh, Richard used to teach her Portuguese. He was her teacher. But just like um, Scott DeHart, I think, very accurately presents that um, Mary Shelley cooperated with um, uh, Percy Shelley in, in the writing of Frankenstein. In other words, Percy Shelley wrote Frankenstein and Mary Shelley... Uh, you know, she, she agreed to have that credited to her because Percy was, when it was first published under anonymous, he was getting in trouble for the ideas that were in that book. So, um, Mary Shelley had to take the credit to keep her husband out of jail. You know, read Scott DeHart's book, uh, Shelley Unbound. Uh, forget all this feminist icon crap about Mary Shelley. Okay. Ugh. It, it's nonsense. It's just social nonsense. Um, read Scott DeHart's book, Shelley Unbound, and, and you'll, you'll get straightened up about Frankenstein. I think that Isabel Burton and Richard did a similar thing. Richard did not want anyone knowing how directly fascinated he was with manuscript 512 and that that's the reason he probably really took the, uh, Brazilian assignment. Fawcett. Yes. Gigi, uh, we know that Fawcett disappeared, uh, 1925 looking for the lost city of Z, which I argue he totally got Z from Zarahemla. Okay. The, the, as it's described in the book of Mormon. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's who we're talking about. Uh, we don't know exactly what happened to Fawcett, right? He gets lost and with his son and their friend, Raleigh Rimmel. Um, Nick asks, Weren't there Germans? I'm not aware of a German thread to all of this. Doesn't mean it's not there. In fact, I would say the Germans were probably looking for it. Isn't that interesting? You asked that question, Nick. What, what were the Germans doing with this whole Lost Cities thing? in South America. Why, why do we not know that hand at hand? Hey, Giza Death Star community. Joseph Farrell is here with us. Hello, Joseph. <coughs> Philip Blair asks, is there any Basque connection? Uh, Luz can be a Basque name. Was he from a Basque family, even though he sailed from Portugal? It's very possible. I have to look at him again. Um, Camoans, uh, here's the interesting thing. Scholars have pointed out that the Basques being such a unique, specific subculture there on the Spanish peninsula, that they are among the oldest of the European bloodlines. And, uh, many point, uh, a connection between the Basques and, um, the civilization in Mesoamerica. Okay, so some people point to the Basques as uh, descendants of whatever Atlantis was as far as a wider empire. So there could very well be a Basque connection to um, Camoans and Os Luciados, um, you know, certainly, certainly. And I'll be pulling that thread, of course. Every Wednesday night now, Joseph, every Wednesday night is my live stream night. Wednesdays, 6 p.m. PST. So <coughs> this has been, um, this is one of my most, um, uh, uh, Joseph, I recommend that you get your hands on the resources that um, Nick, our friend Nick N, sent to me just in the last week. Um, the two-volume set, World Vedic Heritage, 
by P.N. Oak. Uh, World Vedic Heritage, A History of Histories. It's in two volumes, Joseph. It's 1,400 pages between the two volumes, and it is the Vedic perspective on history. And um, it's a fascinating resource, fascinating resource. Check it out if you can get your hands on it. Um, these editions come from an Indian publisher. And again, I thank uh, Nick in for sending me this, plus the model kit stuff. I'm going to start. Uh, I, I, let me tell you, Nick sent me an amazing uh, box of modeling tools and stuff, and I'm finally going to be setting up a proper model building table. So, um, <clears throat> so there we go. I cannot wait, <coughs> but, um, you guys know that I'm very proud of this book. This, um, for the longest time was my favorite of all my books I've written. And then of course I wrote that little book, the esoteric Napoleon, which I'm also proud of. Um, but this one, seriously, um, I feel like, um, of uh, all my attempts at scholarship, this is a very strong one. And I haven't finished with the material that's in here yet, obviously. Um, not by a long shot, because I do think that um, there is a Vedic history connection to the Americas. And it might be, folks, it might be, it might be more directly through the Kham Empire, C-H-A-M, the Kham Empire. Now remember, the Kham Empire, as I said earlier, was comprised of cultures from India, North Africa, specifically Egypt, um, then Siam, which is Thailand, of course, um, Southeast Asia, other areas throughout Southeast Asia, Australia, and the Pacific Islands, okay, from, you know, the northern Pacific on down to the southern, the South Pacific, to the coasts of the Americas, South America in particular. And I argue that the Kham Empire explorers reached North America because I think the Kham Empire explains the necropolis reportedly found in the Grand Canyon in the 1908 Arizona Gazetteer uh, article. I think the Kham Empire is a very realistic, actual, historical um, uh, possibility for whatever was found and has since been suppressed by the Smithsonian Institution. Um, so you, you gotta, you gotta check out this calm empire because that could explain the Vedic thread. Okay. Um, but the, the city of manuscript 512, um, presently in my opinion was, is a real city and um, was built by either the Kham Empire or somebody, some culture connected to the Vedic history, okay? I do not buy that it was a city built by a lost tribe of Israelites, okay? I just don't buy that. Um, Here we have let me see. <coughs> Mariah 577. When the Spanish got to the Americas, there was a Basque priest among them who could understand the Maya language. There you go. Yeah. That's that's a well known um episode in history, the history of the Americas. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, what does that argue? I think that totally argues a past connection, you know, between these cultures. Uh, our, our friend here, uh, Giza Death Star, Joseph Farrell, has written about, and, and others have written about how really the, the whole Columbus episode in 1492 was really a dog and pony show and an official opening um, of the Americas, really, when you think about it, for commerce and resources. Because, look, Columbus himself likely came to the Americas in 1485. Okay. Uh, dig into that. You'll, you know, learn about the 1485 possibility, the document, which he wrote and submitted to, um, Isabella and Ferdinand of Spain refers to uh, a, a prior knowledge 
of the Americas prior to 1492. There's just so much evidence for this. Our friend uh, Dr. Farrell has written about this. David Childers has written about this. And, and many other researchers in between those two have written about this and pointed it out. And of course, you know, this points to the, um, the, the cartographic tradition, okay, the ancient cartographic tradition in which they found the old portalons and the old maps from the previous civilization um, seized during the Fourth Crusade, just to, for one example, from the archive, the National Archive of um, Constantinople. Okay. A funny thing happened on the way to the, the, the Middle East during the Fourth Crusade. They just decided not to go to the Middle East and... <laughs> Stop at Constantinople and, you know, and on and so forth. And, and you get the idea. Um, again, that could be explained from the Vedic perspective. Notice I'm carefully saying the Vedic perspective because, okay, it may not be exactly what historians like Mr. Oak in this book uh, say, but... It could be some offshoot, like the Kham Empire, could explain a Vedic cultural through linguistics and other means. Uh, it, it could explain it. But I have no problem with it being a literal, um, you know, Rama Empire explanation. You know, absolutely could have been the Rama Empire. It could have been the empires discussed in the Mahabharata. You know, this is, goes back, um, you know, before this massive war, global war, or as you know, we talk about, um, the, uh, cosmic war. Let's see. Whoop, whoop. I'm missing some comments here. Uh, Giza death star. Our friend Joseph Farrell says Wallace Judd is the one that really delved into Basque Meso America connection. Wallace Judd. I'm going to write that name down. Wallace Judd. I will definitely. Oh, Wallace. Judd. Thank you. The Basque Mezzo connection. Okay. So have you heard of Wallace Judd? We need to look him up. Joseph recommended him. Trotter 711 says the Mormon temple garment markings are identical to the markings on John D's ring. Um, now I've not heard that before. I know they're identical to the square and compass. Uh, in some cases of Freemasonry, because we know that Smith just was in love with Freemasonry um, and other weirdness. But um, <laughs> yes, what's that? Oh yes, yes, yes. I will not forget that. <laughs> okay, so um, let's go down to the new comments here. Make sure I'm not <laughs> Wallace Stacy Judd. Okay, it could be Wallace Stacy Judd. Stacy Judd, I'm familiar with Stacy hyphen Judd. Yeah. Okay, cool. Cool, cool, cool. Definitely uh, look that up. <clears throat> so um I've discovered, you know, I, I've, I've been sent some new toys, thanks, courtesy of Nick, um, some, some Vedic historical perspective literature, which I'm going to uh, dive into and see if I can, you know, do some uh, analysis and, and see what I think um, stands up to scrutiny. But uh, it, it it's looking good so far from this perspective. And it's so refreshing to you know, look at a perspective that, you know, you're not intimately familiar with. So. <clears throat> anyway. <coughs> okay. Uh, any more questions or comments? Again, all caps in the live chat there. Uh, I Before I forget, I want to let you know that uh, we scheduled you know, the upcoming, uh, several weeks. Um, now next week, next Wednesday, um, I'm hoping to have another trans temporal cosmic warfare discussion. We're not sure. I'm not putting, uh, 
uh, Dr. Farrell on the spot here, whether he can make it or not, we're probably still going to talk about transtemporal cosmic warfare. If Dr. Farrell can make it a week from tonight, great. He'll be here. It'll be an amazing discussion as usual. But as you can see on June 21st, first, I do have that slotted for the transtemporal cosmic warfare topic. Okay, so hopefully uh, Dr. Farrell's been having some weird weather going on there. So it's it's day by day, uh, day to day, I should say. And then on June 28th, I'm going to have Melissa Tittle. Melissa Tittle is the producer who's been developing my Empire of the Wheel trilogy into a fantastic dramatic series project. And folks, um, she does a lot of other interesting things. She is the producer, president, CEO of Hathor Studios. She's recently been um, traveling around uh, film festivals with a, a film, I think it's Code 12, right? Code 12, which I'm in. It's a documentary film. I'm in Code 12. Check it out. But Melissa Tittle is going to be my guest on June 28th. Then on July 5th, our friend... Our friend Todd Wood will be back with another episode of California. And then on July 12th, we're going to have Brad Olson. Um, and I'm going to get Brad to talk about things that he doesn't, you know, get asked about that much. You know, stuff that is fitting to the Walter Bosley channel audience. So I've been acquainted with Brad for years. And uh, he's a really nice guy and very interesting guy. And um, he's done some great travels. So I'm excited to have Brad on. So those are the upcoming weeks. Um, let's see. Did I miss any comments? Yes. Uh, Dr. Farrell says very weird weather. I even had to move my conversation with Catherine Fitz this Saturday. Wow. Yeah. I've been noticing, I've been paying attention to your comments and it's been so wacky there. You've, you've had to change your schedule numerous times. Yikes. Just uh, take care of that little doggy, Shiloh. <laughs> Make sure uh, she's all safe. So um, anyway, oh, well, um, remember my new book coming out <coughs> in September, Nimza, How America Sold Its Soul, is going to be available uh, off the press in September, but is available now for pre-order. Go to lostcontinentlibrary.com. Is that correct? Go to lostcontinentlibrary.com and, and get your copy of NIMSA, How America Sold Its Soul. Uh, reserve your copy now. Do, do your pre-order, okay? And uh, you'll be glad you did. Folks, um, this is not going to be a fun book to read. It's certainly not a happy book. It's a very depressing subject. I started to work on this a few years back, and I'll be honest with you, I, I found the subject um, troubling, very troubling. But it was time to dive back into it. And it's really unlike, in certain ways, it's unlike any book I've written, okay? It's certain aspects of it. Um, but uh, I, it's a book I have to write. It's a book that has to be out there. And you guys, if you're going to understand the threads I'm pulling um, with this whole topic of the mysterious NIMSA and the and, and Dr. Farrell's uh, Nazi International by extension, I think this is a book that you are going to have to read to get even more the whole picture of. Um, this dark, nefarious era or age in our history. Um, anyway, <coughs> you can pre-order it now at the Walter Bosley channel, or the Walter Bosley, excuse me, lostcontinentlibrary.com. But if you scroll down in the community tab, you can find the link to it. But pre-order your copy now. It'll be out in uh, September. <coughs> Yes, I just saw it. Nick said, I will only pay full price for the new book. Thank you, Nick. I, uh, what Nick is referring to is if you pre-order it, thank you, Nick, for bringing this up, though. It's a sale. It's a marketing point. <laughs> it is $5 cheaper. 
it, it, you get a discount by doing the pre-order. Okay, the, the, the final retail price is going to be more than what the pre-order price is. But I thank you, Nick. Thank you. I appreciate that generosity. Um, CSO the second asks, what happened to Kincaid after his Grand Canyon discovery? I don't know. See, that's what's mysterious is this Kincaid guy and Jordan. These uh, ended up being, you know, they're hard to trace, just like this necropolis. We do know that there's an area of the Grand Canyon that not even um, employees of the Department of Interior are allowed to go to. I mean, not all the park rangers are allowed to go. And that's probably where this necropolis was found. Uh, yeah, Joseph, I will send you a copy of that because I think you'll find it um very interesting, and and you you'll be very familiar with some of my sources. Um, Philip Blair asks, "Who are the main characters?" Uh, well, Prescott Bush will certainly be mentioned, but I'm going to be naming other names, so it's forthcoming. One of the ways in which it's different from most of the stuff I write is it will have a very contemporary chapter. It'll be pointing to things in our world today and people in our world today. So it's one of those books that could get me in trouble. Solite, US expat, how you doing? He asks, Solite asks, will you do another show regarding time travel and also talk about the Kazarev mirror? I definitely will uh, talk about those things. Um, definitely. Maybe sooner than uh, later, now that you asked. <clears throat> Remember, folks, all caps if you want me to acknowledge the comment or respond to it. D. Dorothy Papineau says, I'm looking forward to getting the NIMSA book. Thank you, D. I'm looking forward to getting it out there. I really am. It, and again, it's as dark and and not fun as it is. I really, it's important info to get out there. Soul Light US Expat says, I bought a Nexstar BSE and I got a 4K camera to do live shows. Cool. Excellent. Okay. Well, folks, we're, you know, we're approaching an hour and a half. We're at an hour and 27 minutes. I want to thank all of you for being here. Um, I want to thank all the new subscribers that have shown up and, um, please come back next week. Of course, when we're going to be talking about trans temporal cosmic warfare. And if the schedule and the weather permits, Dr. Farrell will be joining us. If, if the technology and the scheduling permits, and um, it, it's always a fantastic discussion. Again, if you're interested in the book I was talking about tonight, my book, it's uh, this one here, Secret Missions 2, The Lost Expedition of Sir Richard Francis Burton, um, in which I talk about the city of Manuscript 512. And, um, I, you know, if you missed any of this, go back and watch the replay. Um, I really think... The mystery of uh, the city of Manuscript 512, um, there's going to be answers found from the Vedic historical perspective, okay? From that perspective, just like any other source, you know, the, the, the specific sources and authors may not have it exact, but they could be on the right track. Um, I, I feel that the Kham Empire will likely fill the gaps that perhaps the Vedic historical perspective might not be able to answer as far as the city of Manuscript 512 and other such lost city mysteries in South America. Um, again, one of my favorite uh, subjects. Um, uh, thank you, ModWiz. ModWiz says he's going to get the NIMSA book. Thank you, thank you. And uh, Solite talks about the telescope. It's an eight-inch aperture. Excellent. Look forward to uh, hearing uh, later. Uh, Talk to you later, uh, Joseph. Um, and again, before I go, I want, I, as I teased several minutes ago, I'm going to tease again. I am by no means done with research on this stuff right here on Burton and the South American cities. And Malia and I are in the near future going to be um, going down to do some direct research finally in South America. And let's just say you might be able to join us. 
and we'll be sharing those circumstances um, fairly soon. Did you tell him I lived there for five years? Uh, Malia lived in Mexico for five years, specifically in the Yucatan, um, all around the archaeological sites and such. And we're going to be going there, of course, maybe for an extended visit at some point, but also down into South America. And again, you guys might, some of you might be able to join us if you so desire. So more on that in the future. I want to thank everybody again for being here. Um, we had a great turnout, great turnout in the live chat. Um, and uh, again, I thank you if you're a new viewer, a new subscriber, but if you're a new viewer, hit the subscribe button, make sure you come back, check out lostconnetlibrary.com, walterbosley.com, um, pre-order the NIMSA book. Uh, it's, it's at a discount price if you pre-order it. Thank you, all of you who have already ordered it. Thank you. And um, I will see you next week for another exciting discussion on the trans-temporal cosmic warfare topic. Okay, everybody, have a good night. Thank you again. Did you see the last thing?